writing craft book on your bedside table? Has it been there for a while? Do you keep meaning to get past chapter two or chapter one or just the first page? Then the Words to Write By podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Renee. I teach composition and creative writing to college students. My background is in poetry, but I'm working on my memoir. And I'm Kim. I'm trained as a science journalist, but now I'm trying my hand at short fiction. Each week we'll be tackling a chapter of some well-known, but perhaps not so well-read, writing craft book. Together, we'll uncover brilliant insights, face the hard truth, and totally disagree when the author is wrong. This is our podcast, after all. And then, we're going to take what we learn and apply it to our own writing. By doing the book's suggested exercises. We're inviting you to read along, or just tune in for the Cliff Notes version. We're committed to improving our own craft, one writing advice book at a time. And we'd love for you to join us. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Words to Write By. I just wanted to take a quick moment to remind you about our Patreon account. Please go to Patreon and check us out. You can chime in with your own reactions to some of our prompts. You can join our community. You could read our show notes. We'll have more to say at the end of the podcast. So, Kim, what words did you write this week? I think it's better to say what words did we write this week because... We went a little bit out of our comfort zone and contacted an organization in San Jose and offered to do a how to podcast presentation. Yeah, so the San Jose Women's Club. So for our California Bay Area listeners, you may be familiar, may not, there is a club in San Jose. They have their own historical building and they are a wonderful organization. I have worked with them before. And uh, Kim and I were like, hey, maybe we can share some of this knowledge that we're gaining because a lot of people want to join a podcast. I mean, we know we wanted to. Everybody wants to do a podcast these days. Everybody wants to do a podcast. And Kim was like, hey, why don't we share this? And I thought, San Jose Women's Club, what better place? So we wrote the email and we got a response right away and they were interested. So we talked to them and set up to do a introduction to podcast presentation set for June 15th. It's going to be a hybrid. So there will be both in person and also online. We'll put the link on our webpage and you can sign up through Eventbrite. For tickets, they're free. So yep. we'd love to see you guys. If you want to learn a little more about podcasting, if you haven't quite gotten a, your fix of Renee and Kim for the week, we will post all of this on our website and also in our newsletter. We really love it if you join us, especially if you'd like to start a podcast. And if you want to know more about San Jose Women's Club, we will also link them to our website and you can see all the wonderful things they do. And uh, you can become a member of the San Jose Women's Club for free. You just got to email them and they will send you a promo code and join up. It's one of those like pay what you feel you ought to. So if you've got some money to pay for a membership, that's great. But they want to make it open to anybody that is in the area that might want to belong to this club. Exactly. Exactly. So we look forward to seeing you there. And now on with the show. On with the show. In today's episode, Bradbury tells us how loathing Ireland pushed him to becoming a playwright screenwriter, how he doesn't hold with these absurdist plays, and the secret of successfully turning his short stories into film. Okay, full disclosure, Renee and I basically disagree with both of these chapters from Zen and the Art of Writing, and we don't know what shooting haiku in a barrel means. But disagreements make for great podcasting. And if you're into film analysis, this is the episode for you. Okay, so let's preface this by saying that overall, I've been really impressed by this book. I've been getting a lot out of it. Look at the title, Zen in the Art of Writing. It's kind of like, what is your mindset for being a creative writer? And I've gotten a whole ton of stuff. And now we come to these two chapters. So this is the part of the journey with Bradbury where we kind of break off and say these two chapters were not the best. They were kind of useless, to be perfectly honest. Kind of frustrating, too. Like, this isn't quite Garner-level Helen of Troy, but there was just a lot of what the heck is he trying to say here? I have my theories. 
as to some of what's going on here. But let's just say that if I were to recommend this book to somebody, I would say to just skip these two chapters altogether. What would you say, Cam? Yeah. And if they had your version of the book, they'd have to skip one of them anyway because it wasn't in it. <laughs> right. So I'm, <laughs> I'm reading this and I'm going through, I'm like, don't we do two chapters now? We're saving the key one at the end, the Zen and the Art of Writing at chapter for later. But I keep looking. There is no more chapters. And so I'm texting Kim late at night. I'm like, what's going on here? Because this is late at night, several days before the podcast. We prepare quite a bit extensively sure. for this. We don't, you know, put yeah. it off to the last minute. No, not at, no. No, not at all. We're not, we're not those So several kinds of people late into the night, several days ago, right? I'm like, Kim, are we reading this one? I thought we read this one already. She goes, yeah, we read that one. We're doing the next two. And then you mentioned this thing about haikus. And I'm looking in my book and I'm looking and looking like haikus. What? I don't see this. And so I sent a picture of the contents and there is no chapter in my version of the book that has shooting haikus in a barrel. So maybe I have a magical version of this book that has an extra special chapter. Right, or I'm in a different dimension. And in this dimension, that one was never written. So no, I, I looked at the production date. So it looks like I have a very early version of the book. It's only two years after the original publication. At the very top of the page, it says, This edition contains the complete text of the original hardcover edition. Not one word has been omitted. <laughs> That's important, too. Yeah, sure. I have never seen that on a publication page. But then again, I don't normally look at those pages. But yes, if you have an old copy, and it clearly looks like it comes from the 90s. You know, it's got the teal color and then the purple oh, swish. Got it's got jazzercise outfit colors. Totally has a jazzercise color outfit. So if you've got this one, you are missing a chapter. But, but you know what? You do don't. Not... You don't have to return your book and get the newer one. You're, you're good. Yeah. Don't. Don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go into specifically what we didn't like or didn't enjoy about these Let's. chapters? The first chapter is called "The Secret Mind," and his advice too is a secret. Let's just say. The basic take was that Ray Bradbury's consciousness hated Ireland. His subconscious lapped it up and even pushed him to try a new genre. So I think the idea here is that he had this bad experience when he was in Ireland, but then later on he discovered there was all this stuff he got out of it. But although I think that's what the idea of the chapter was, that's not what I got out of actually reading it. Ah, oh, what did you get out of reading it? I was rather confused. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So in this chapter, he was invited to write Moby Dick for the screen. And they chose Ireland as the space, I suppose. So he's stuck up there in Ireland. And he was just put off by all the poverty and how gray it was. The guy is from California, or he's not from California, but he moved to California. I mean, he lived in Santa Monica. I mean, he's living in this really nice you know, place in California. For $30 a month. For $30 a month, right? And then he goes to Ireland, and I guess it is pretty dreary. Also, dear listener, I have been to Ireland. <laughs> I didn't think it was that drab, but it may have been back in the 50s. And here's something that we Americans don't realize, is that we think of the 1950s as this incredible decade of prosperity, and the rest of Europe was actually recovering from a war. There's a reason why there was a lot of poverty and things weren't going so well. I, I don't think Bradbury was giving the people or the place of Ireland a fair shot. And granted, when you're used to being in California when it's sunny all the time and you go to a place where it's rainy all the time, that can get a person down. Yeah. He may have also had that thing where people who don't get enough sun, they get all depressed and stuff. I mean, obviously, I'm just trying to diagnose the problem here because every other essay was good. So... Using my hypothesis of what the chapter is about, the idea is that you can be in a place that you really don't like, and then later on you realize it has changed you and it causes you to draw new stuff. Like sad childhoods make for great further stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Angela's Ashes. That's not really what this chapter is. 
he's not talking about how he had this bad experience and how it worked in his subconscious and how it produced all these other things. Because we're not given really good examples of anything here because the majority of this is talking about his theory of screenwriting, right? Kind of, yeah. He says, but the subliminal eye is shrewd. While I lamented my hard work and my inability every other day to feel as much like Herman Melville as I wished, my interior self kept alert, snuffed deep, listened long, watched close, and filed Ireland and its people for other times when I might relax and let them team forth to my own surprise. So he sets us up for the topic. Like, okay, the topic is, I didn't think this experience would be useful to me. But years later, he claims that it is. However, the plane never lands. He sets us up and then starts talking about screenwriting having nothing to do with Ireland and starts giving us some advice, which is very interesting because, you know, he normally doesn't give outward advice like that in like bullet point form like maybe Gardner would do. But then he starts to do that. And it's weird. What I also noticed very Gardner-like was a complete dissing of all modern playwrights and those absurdist plays that did deliver on what was expected. This is very much old school. Those kids these days don't know how to write a proper play. Which is really funny because the chapter right before this was about how kids birthed science fiction and the interest in science fiction. <laughs> so it's just very <laughs> odd. Here's my theory. I believe he wrote this after he saw the opening night of his play that he had written. And he's filled with all of this crazy, magical feeling of, oh my God, that was amazing. You feel electric after some experience like that. And he just felt he had to write it down. And he came home and he wrote it down, but he never went back to look at how awful it was. To wit, here is some odd advice. Now done and busy with other plays about science fiction machineries, do I have an after-the-fact theory to fit playwriting? For only after can one nail down, examine, and explain. To try to know beforehand is to freeze and kill. Oh, now it's going to get weird. Self-consciousness is the enemy of all art, be it acting, writing, painting, or living itself, which is the greatest art of all. Here's how my theory goes. We writers are up to the following. We build tensions towards laughter then give permission and laughter comes. We build tensions towards sorrow and at last say cry and hope to see our audience in tears. We build tensions towards violence, light the fuse and run. It just goes on and on. Is he just saying, you know, you tell a story with a beginning, middle and end? Yeah. That's all he's saying over and over and over again. Yeah. So he's just giving the middle finger to absurdist plays. So absurdist plays were like a thing back then. Well, I mean, that's the end of Waiting for Godot, and oh, yeah. you had um, Rosencrantz and Gildestern are dead. And... Would you say that Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was also slightly absurdist? I haven't actually seen it, but I'm guessing probably. Uh, it, it kind of fell flat at the end. I was like, really? So wait, did he just go see those plays and just be like, poo-poo on you guys? You annoyed me? Probably. <laughs> That is really funny, given in another chapter, he talked about how he loved all sorts of influence. Yeah, this chapter has a lot of like, look how successful I was. And I think that he's ignoring the primary thing that made him such a successful screenwriter and playwriter at this point, which is that he was already an established writer. He was already Ray Bradbury, writer of the Martian Chronicles and other pieces that had been adapted towards film. And when you have a big name like that, you're gonna get people really willing to, like, this wasn't the earlier chapters where he was cranking out Fahrenheit 451 in the library sort of stuff. This is something that he took on after he was established and he did very well in it. I see. So he's just kind of old and curmudgeonly. No, I see Not it now. that old, but, no. <laughs> but, but yeah. Here he's like, if I were to advise new writers... If I were to advise the new writer in myself, going into the theater of the absurd, capital, absurd, the almost absurd, the theater of ideas, the any kind of theater at all, I would advise like this. Tell me no pointless jokes. <laughs> I will laugh at your refusal to allow me laughter. And he goes on and on and on. I wonder what play he saw. What do you think he saw? 
if anybody out there is a Ray Bradbury scholar and they have an idea about maybe what play he saw that would set him off for this one, we'd, we'd love to hear it. Put in our comment section. Don't forget, dear listener, that this is supposed to be about Ireland. Maybe there are a lot of absurdist playwriters in Ireland. I bet it was waiting for Godot because you wait and wait and wait and nothing really happens. Yes, it's in the title. <laughs> right. And he also says, I ask only for proper endings based on proper assessments of energy contained and given detonation. Can't we just have a story in this play? Does it all have to be so intellectual? Where is Godot, God damn it! <laughs> oh. So moving right along to the chapter that Renee did not have access to. I did read it. If you type in Zen and the Art of Writing PDF, you will find a free copy of Zen and the Art of Writing. With the essay I didn't have in my uh, 90s jazzer hands book. Which has the title, Shooting Haiku in a Barrel. Renee, I am not a poet, so I'm not trained in these things, but could you explain to me what this term, shooting haiku in a barrel, is? I'm thinking kind of like a koi fish, because it's Japanese, swimming around and around, but I don't know. I just imagine like this little tiny poem on a piece of paper just swirling around the barrel. <laughs> It's so small, though, you can't shoot it. Okay, so we can establish that nobody knows what it means. It sounds cool, though. This isn't really an essay. It, what it is is a transcribed interview by Mitch Tuckman. And so he had a sit-down interview with Bradbury before the release of Disney's version of Something Wicked This Way Comes. So, history here. Disney in the 80s decided that they didn't want to just be a family-friendly cartoon-making studio. And so they decided to push it with a couple of things that would be a little bit different. This is way before, you know, they just started buying properties and all that other stuff. And Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is a, a horror tale. It felt actually very much like a Stephen King novel in certain ways. Some kind of demonic creature comes to a small town and starts causing trouble and only the pure of heart in the end can, can get rid of them. Completely legitimate, great story, perfect for the 1980s. This article was obviously written before the release. The comment is, Bradbury's been adapting and readapting and readapting the little story of Will Holloway and Jim Nightshade and the demonic carousel whose writers age a year with each revolution. He is satisfied that the Jack Clayton version, which Disney will release in February, quote, is the closest yet of anything of mine on the screen. He seems pleased with their collaboration. I spent six months doing a whole new screenplay for Jack, which was a gorgeous experience because Jack is a wonderful man to sit with on every afternoon. Okay, so in fact, Disney switched directors at the end and did extensive re-editings on this. Furthermore, Jack Clayton, without Bradbury's knowledge, hired another screenwriter to go over the screenplay before it was filmed. Oh, burn. So what this tells me is that this whole little interview here is one of those let's paper over things and make nice interviews. So you think Bradbury was aware of all this by the time they had this interview? I don't know exactly, but I think this is much more of PR interview than a deep investigative interview. It's a very positive interview. So this guy, Clayton. Clayton was the director? Oh, he was the director. Okay. So in one of Bradbury's answers in this interview, he said that he had a 260-page screenplay. And then the director said, well, can you get it down to 880 pages? And so he did. And then he goes, okay, cut 30 more pages. And then keep cutting and keep cutting. And he got it down to 120 pages. But even after all of that, it still had to go through... Somebody else. Somebody else. I gotta say, it's okay if you can't cross genre. Not everybody can be a poet and a novelist and a screenwriter. There's a lot of money writing on Hollywood films. And in the end, there's a bunch of studio executives and other individuals that get a say on this stuff. This is a story told again and again in Hollywood about some director that got screwed over, some screenwriter that got screwed over, some movie that got redone. And this is why we have director's cuts that come out afterwards. I also saw that they had 
two different soundtracks. They had a completely scored musical soundtrack for the, the movie, and then they went with somebody else for it. They really revised everything. Yeah. Wow. I like the story of this movie. <laughs> I like what happened here. This is really interesting. This is the Justice League circa 1980. <laughs> oh. So what can this tell us about writing? Does Bradbury give us any actual advice here for the new writer or for any writer for that matter? I found this interview to be very a soft interview. It repeats some of the stuff from earlier. I did like the line, the main thing is compression. It isn't cutting so much as learning metaphor. The bit about how he had to rewrite the screenplay shorter and shorter and it got stronger and stronger is a good thing to keep in mind when you're writing something and someone says, well, it's just too long. You're like, no, this has all the really important things. This is so critical. This is all important. If you put the piece away and come back to it in a day or two, you may find, yeah, I can make this shorter. And one really valuable skill as a writer that wants to get paid is when the editor says, can you make this shorter? You say, okay, there are ways to write it so you don't lose stuff. Right. You know, it's a visual media and everything has to be shown. Everything. And metaphor is not, it's a little elusive. You could throw in all sorts of imagery that isn't going to work. But what I'm saying is you could write, and this is more for fiction writing than necessarily screenplay. I don't know anything about screenplay writing, so I've got to go with what my personal experience is. But you're writing a scene and you can describe a person doing all the steps for this scene. And it takes a lot of work. Or you might just cut away to an emotion that they have or a they felt like this or some sort of way to compact it. And it's still going to work for your audience. There are tricks to maintaining the feel that you want without having everything spelled out in text. The only advice I could find was at the end. Okay. And he did talk about the haiku stuff. He goes, a good director would find a way because what you're shooting is haiku. You're shooting haiku in a barrel. He goes, let me give you an example of what we're talking about. I've been lecturing at the University of Southern California Cin Cinema Department for 22 years. I go down there a couple times a year and various students have come up to me and said, can we make films of your short stories? And I say, sure, take them, do it. But there's one restriction I put on you. Shoot the whole story. Just read what I've done and line up the shots by the paragraphs. You're not allowed to change the ending. Right. All of the paragraphs are shots. By the way the paragraph reads, you know whether it's a close-up or a long shot. So by God, those students with their little cameras and $500 have shot better films than the big productions I've had because they followed the story. I, the fact that he includes this in the interview, I think, might show that he's not quite so satisfied with this big budget production of his work that's going to come out. I might agree. And now I think I might have a better understanding of what he means by shooting haiku in a barrel. A haiku is a poem, and he is very poetic, and I think he thought of his art as poetry. A lot of people agree that Bradbury was an incredibly poetic writer. Right. And I think by shooting it in a barrel, you're cheapening it. You're trying to capture the art of something in a film and it cheapens the art. What does it mean to shoot an apple in a barrel? Or is fish. that a fish in a barrel? A fish in a barrel. It's, it's easy, right? Like you shoot a fish in a barrel, you're shooting something that's like right in front of you and it can't get away. Never mind that the way that light travels through water and air is differently, so it's not quite exactly where you think it is. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. But with haiku, I guess he's saying, it's not that hard. Just look at my work. And each paragraph, it should be great on the screen. And I think that's what he originally did. Maybe count all the paragraphs. That's 260 pages worth of work. And he keeps cutting. You keep cutting all of these paragraphs, he says, that are already cinematic. So... This all leads up to a very interesting and I think really cool exercise we came up for this week. I was talking to Phil Nichols, who we interviewed earlier about Ray Bradbury's screenplays and all that. And I was saying, should we watch Something Wicked This Way Comes? That led to the whole story about what happened in the screenplay. But he did give me some Ray Bradbury screenplays based on his short stories that he wrote the screenplay for that were adapted to the Ray Bradbury theater production. 
and he gave me a couple names of them of suggestions. And what we're going to do is we're going to go and watch one of these films without reading the short story. And then we're going to pick a scene and we're going to write our own version of what we think was in the scene. And then we're going to go back to the original story and we're going to see how close we came. Yeah. I mean, okay. Now I have some questions. What, what is our goal here? To it, have fun? Okay. Yes. Yes. That will always be the goal. But what is our goal in the pursuit of improving our craft? So when we are done and we look at our version and Bradbury's version, are we trying to see how close they are? Like, or what were they able to translate from his story visually on the screen? Or are we trying to say like, oh, look how Bradbury-like I sound? So we're not going to try to imitate Bradbury. Okay. But what we are going to do is we're going to look at these scenes and assuming what Bradbury said, that it was all that was in the story, we are going to construct a text version of what we see, like something that would be more literary, prose version, and just see the details that we noticed versus what was actually in the short story. So we're going to see just how cinematic his paragraphs are. Yeah. You said yourself for a class, you were once required to write out a particular scene. No, it was not for a particular class. It was from a really good craft book I thought was called The Scene Book. And it was in the activity. I was reading the book myself and doing the activity. Okay. And so you were forced to look at this and pick up all the details and, and translate it to paper. So that sounds like a pretty cool exercise you did. Yeah, it took a really long time. And if I would have done it again, I wouldn't have spent so much time on it. So now we're going to get to do it. Right. And I think another goal of writing this is that we're not doing an analysis of every single thing in the scene. We're trying to capture the plot of the scene and the feel of the scene in prose. So we keep the dialogue and we're going to describe the scene from start to finish. So if it starts like in a car, we don't start the scene after they left the car with a flashback to in the car. Okay. Right. And then we just kind of fill it in as much as we can to figure out how we would write that as a really good scene, a really good prose scene. Right. And keep in mind that we're going to translate it to another genre. So it went from novel or short story form and it was translated into film. And then from film, we're taking it back and putting it into prose. So we're not trying to just make it look like the movie in your head while you're reading it. That wouldn't be a fair way, is it? You know, look at this activity going, oh, well, I'm reading Renee's version of this, but I don't see the film in my head. When I rewatch the film, I can't tell what scene this is. Eh, I mean, we'll see what comes out. Okay. All right. Maybe I'm overthinking it like I always do. And with that, I think we've got some TV time to go for. <laughs> People ask, where do you get your ideas? Right here. All oh, this is my magician's toy shop. I'm Ray Bradbury. This is... Okay, so we watched the movie and we've written something up. Let's first talk about the movie. Yeah, the film. So listeners, yeah, we do meet in person. And together, me and Cam watched this film. We found it on YouTube, right? Uh-huh. It was called, what was it called? The Great Wide World? The Great Wide World Over There. The Great Wide World Over There. And this was not science fiction. It was just a story. The screenplay and the short story were written by Bray Bradbury, right? Right. The short story it came from was written in 1952, and this performance uh, was recorded in 1992. Wow. So quite a bit of difference in time. Yeah. <laughs> was that 40 years? Am I doing the math right? Yep. Wow. One really impressive element of the performance was the actress that played the main character, Cora. Her name was Tyne Daly, and she looked very familiar but I wasn't quite sure how to place her. And then I looked up her bibliography and she was Lacey from Cagney and Lacey, which is a TV series I never watched about a couple of female detectives in the 80s, but it was imprinted on my brain. 
Anyway, the woman was brilliant. She had this way of moving her eyebrows and giving a look that was just priceless. The way it was written was very 90s. It had that wholesome bent to it, but that also meant that a lot of the lines seemed rather cheesy. And man, this woman took these lines and she made them genuine, so real that it really just broke your heart watching. Like my intellectual brain was like, really? That's the line? But I, then I see her deliver it and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that was done so well. Like you really feel for these characters in this film. So yes, it's rather dated, but she did such a great job. As we said, it's not science fiction. Watching it, I kept kind of waiting that first little bit of time to see if it was science fiction, but it wasn't. The premise is that you had this woman that lives on a farm with her husband in a very remote area, and she's illiterate, and she has no contact with the outside world. And her neighbor keeps getting letters and is always talking about how she got this wonderful letter from her uncle, and Cora, the main character, has no uncles to write to her, and she couldn't read even if they did. Yeah, Cora didn't even have a mailbox. No. And then her nephew comes to visit. Her nephew has seen the world and he can read and write. And so she asks him to help her write letters. This is what she really wants. But when it comes time to write the letters, she doesn't know who she's going to write it to. Yeah, everyone is dead, right? She says her uncles are all gone. And Benji is her nephew, right? So is her sister's son, but it's implied that she's gone. She's dead. So she doesn't have anyone to write to. And they come up with the best idea of who to write to then. Yeah, Benji goes, runs into his room or into the room that he's staying in and pulls out like a comic book. And he goes, look at Cora, we can write to these people. They were advertisements. It was like Power Plus Muscle Company. It like can send you an advertisement, you know, to your door or a detective agency. If you want to know more, please write to blank. And they were free. So they just mailed off these inquiries, essentially, like, oh, I'd like to know more information from these ads. Yeah, it's, it was very amusing to think that somebody would actually be requesting spam mail. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it was. So my scene came about the middle of the film. So this scene happens after they initially started sending out the letters and Cora has gotten her husband to build her a mailbox. He said, I'm going to cut down half the forest. It is a mother of all mailboxes. It is massive and big (laughs) and white. He acts like a total jerk throughout the film, but, you know, he does things that show love. Like he builds that insane mailbox. And so what happens in the film then is that she discovers that the letters that her neighbor is getting are not hers. They are stolen letters from someone else. They're 10 years old and the woman plants them in the mailbox so she can pick them up each day. Right. And it kind of shows off to Cora. Yeah. Yeah. So then I'm going to start reading what I wrote. Each morning, Cora would walk down her driveway to where her handsome new mailbox stood upright and solid, but empty every day, empty while across the road, Miss Brabham would open her dented mailbox, its rusted hinges creaking. Her face would light up with glee as she made a show of pulling out her purloined letters. Hi, Cora, she'd say. I think I'd go right crazy if I didn't get my letters every morning. Her smile would go smug as she took in Cora's empty hands. But one day, after this pantomime had played out, there was a rumbling in the distance that startled both women. There, cresting a hill, came a small blue van bumping along, kicking up dust. The vehicle stopped midway between them, and a man stuck his head out the window. First time I've been on this road for years, his head bobbed as he spoke. Morning, one of you ladies, Mrs. Gibbs? Mrs. Braeborn clutched her letters and sunk back. Cora gathered up her courage. I guess I, she swallowed in the tap her chest. Yes, the man smiled kindly. Mail for you, ma'am. He held up an envelope, smooth and crisp, and she almost ran over to grab it, but no, there's one thing she wanted even more. Please, would you? She was a silly old woman for making a fool of herself, but still. Please, put it in my mailbox? She braced for his refusal. Instead, his smile got bigger, and there was a twinkle in his eyes. No problem, he said, getting out of his van. Behind him, Miss Brabham was like the last dried-out leaf clinging to the branch before the winter wind came to blow it away. 
The postman opened Cora's mailbox and placed the envelope as blazing white as the box's fresh paint inside. Thank you, she said as he closed the box. He tipped his hat. Have a good day. Thank you, she said again. As soon as he turned away, she snatched out the letter, her letter. Cora Gibbs, her name was printed on it. She'd have to find Benji to read the rest. And then they'd open it and he'd read it and a thought struck her. And she called out, any mail for Mrs. Braybum? The postman turned to her neighbor who cowered and squeezed the wrinkled gray letters to her chest. No Braybum, he said, just Gibbs. He got back into his van and drove away. As the dust settled, Cora waved her letter, friendly-like. Mrs. Braybum opened her mouth, but said nothing. She took a step back and another before turning to flee. Nice. Yeah, it was, it was fun writing something. We haven't done a writing exercise for a while. Yeah, I've been kind of like itching to be able to practice the craft a little bit more. So this was a great exercise to do that. Okay, so then I went and found the story, which actually has the name of Cora and the Great Wide World, which makes it sound like a children's book. Mm, yeah. It was in McLean's, uh, McLean's magazine from 1952. So this is roughly the same scene that I read. Listen, said Cora. They listened. A car, said Benji. And up the blue hills and through the tall, fiery green pines and along the dusty road, mile by mile, came the sound of a car riding along and along until finally at the bend, it came full thundering. And in an instant, Cora was out the door and running as she ran. She heard and saw and felt many things. First, from the corner of her eye, she saw Mrs. Brayburn, Braybum, gliding down the road from the other direction. Mrs. Braybum, actually, hang on a second. So the weird thing here is that the name in the TV series really sounded like Braybum, and here it actually is Bray, Brabham. Mm. So I will read as Brabham. First, out of the corner of her eye, she saw Mrs. Brabham gliding down the road from the other direction. Mrs. Braham froze when she saw the bright green truck boiling over the grade, and there was the whistle of silver whistle, and the old man in the car leaned out just before Cora arrived and said, Mrs. Gibbs? Yes, she said. Mail for you, ma'am, he said, and held it out towards her. She put out her hand and then drew back, remembering. Oh, she said, please, would you mind? Would you put it, please, in my mailbox? The old man squinted at her, at the mailbox, back at her and laughed. Don't mind, he said, and did just that and put the mail in the box. Mrs. Brabham stood where she was, not moving, eyes wild. Any mail for Mrs. Braham? asked Cora. That's all. And the car dusted away down the road. Mrs. Braham stood with her hands clenched together, then, not looking in her own mailbox, turned and rustled swiftly up her path, out of sight. Interesting. First of all, can we say that Brain Bradbury is an amazing writer? He is. I mean, the poetry of that scene of that car coming along the road and the way it all came together was just having tried to write out something similar myself. And granted, the scene was very different. I'm impressed by exactly how he painted that image. Yeah, it was clear or it made it a very important event. Yeah. Yeah, he is very poetic. So what are the differences and the similarities? I noticed your version had a lot more cues in it. I could see what was going on. It was very cinematic. Right, because I was watching it and I was pausing it and playing it and pausing it and taking notes and playing it. So I got all the dialogue. I got all the scene cuts. When I was writing out, I knew when the camera was looking at what person and what their expression was at that moment. Right. And this is another thing too. Pratbury didn't include a lot of her thoughts, but in your version, it did. And I, lo- I like that. I does say, and in an instant, Cora was out the door running as she ran. She heard and saw and felt many things. But that's it. That felt many things. Whereas in your version... You know, uh, please, would you? She was a silly old woman making a fool of herself, but still. Please, my mailbox. Right. And this one says, she put out her hand, then drew back, remembering. So the visuals are there that you could run a scene from that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I had to get into her head a bit more. And that might just be 
my style versus Bradbury's style. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm hesitant to say that I like yours better because it's Bradbury. But if I did not know who had written what, I may have chosen yours. It may be just the style of the time and you're writing more in a contemporary style and he's writing different style magazine, you know, that it was published in, but I could see everything clearer in your version than Bradbury's version. And we saw the actresses. So I think that also came into play. Like one point where I decided to go more metaphorical as opposed to like describing stuff clearly was Mrs. Braybum was like the last dried out leaf clinging to the branch before the wind, winter wind came to blow it away. Because I remember seeing that scene and that's really kind of the way the actress portrayed that person. Yes. Whereas in Bradbury's story, Mrs. Braham doesn't have much of a role. She pops in and pops out, but we don't get to see her as clearly as we would see an actress. Yeah. Well, that's another point, right? What what did Bradbury delete or how did he revise his work? What got taken out, maybe what got added in between his short story scene and the film? The film definitely made, screenplay definitely made use of the ability to do montages because the scene starts with a montage of Cora and Mrs. Braybum going to the mailbox each day and getting their mail out or not seeing their mail. Mm -hmm. And then also I changed it a little bit in the original scene. It's a montage. And then we cut to the actual scene, which starts with Mrs. Braybun getting out her mail in the morning and saying, I think I'd go right crazy if I didn't get my letters every morning. And the scene plays from that point. So he had more like an infinite time. And he started the scene with them hearing the mail truck and running out to get the mail. Oh, right. So in that one, Mrs. Braymon hasn't even made the show of getting her letters out before the mailman shows up. That's true. That's true. The big difference is that the screenplay clearly has a scene with dialogue and camera shots to establish this is the point where the camera starts the scene and this is where it ends the scene. Whereas when you're writing a short story, you don't have to clearly indicate the scene as much. Or he chose a different way to frame the scene. Right, right. I don't know. I feel like the film did a good job of really highlighting, like there's this car. So in the short story, he does mention a horse and a buggy, and that's how they got around. Whereas in the film, everyone had a car. So I guess maybe a car driving over the hill in the story, an actual car with an engine, you know, that's a special thing. In the film, everyone had a car, but it still felt like a very special thing. Yeah, definitely. The film had this beautiful shot of the van cresting the hill and the light coming down. And it it visually it captured in just one shot the entire description that he used in his piece. Yeah. And I will say this, you know, he said my students could take my paragraphs and write scenes from them. And both of us agreed that no, <laughs> didn't quite turn out that easy or that well. But I will say his dialogue is very cinematic. He has really good dialogue because a lot of it stayed in the film. It transferred over from the short story, but also it says a lot. It gets a lot across. Yeah, what I got was the lines that stayed the same were those critical lines that moved the scene along because the scene had two parts. It had her getting this letter and getting it in her mailbox and taking it out. And it had her calling out her neighbor with the, do you have any mail for Mrs. Braeburn? And both those things were clearly in the short story. Right. Those are the two elements that make this scene significant. Should we explain what happens at the end in the main episode here? No, I think either you can find the short story and watch the movie, or you can come over to our Patreon site and hear Renee's scene, which comes at the end of the film. And we'll discuss the overall, the entire way that the short story changed when it was adapted for film. Right. And keep in mind that it, it, we call it a movie, but it's really a short film. What, it was like 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was part of a TV series similar to something like The Twilight Zone that was just a anthology 
TV series? Yeah. So, and you can get them for free on YouTube and we'll link this one specifically into the website and to Patreon, but there's a whole series of them. I kind of want to watch them now, <laughs> but don't feel intimidated like movie. I have to sit there for a whole movie. It's like, no, no, it's like 20 minutes. So that's will be on our Patreon site. And what else are we going to have on our Patreon site this week, Renee? Uh, so for this week, if you'd like to join in on this writing exercise, I found it very valuable. You know, you're watching a scene, but then you have to like turn it into prose. And a lot of people I've heard say things like, oh, I get a lot of my ideas from TV. So this is putting you on the spot here. You've got to take something that you've seen and then turn it into prose. And Ray Bradbury has some really good emotional hooks of a scene. This isn't a long scene that you have to like spend 10 pages writing out. These are little short pieces. Yes, it would be hard to turn this into an actual hour and a half movie. They are very concise. You know, you could write any of his scenes out from any of these uh, films in a very short amount of time. So for our Pinto members, we will post another short story and another link to the Ray Bradbury Theater. And we'll watch through the film and pick some good scenes to write. And so that will be the Pinto level. Uh, the Abbey level, you'll get our continued discussion here. You'll get to hear my take on one of the scenes from that film. And we'll get your snark notes. You'll get my snark notes, yes. Which will be fairly snarky this time since we didn't really feel like we got that much out of the uh, chapters. The snark will be turned up a bit on Mr. Bradbury, which I think is fair, given we've been very positive so far. But now, now it's like, okay, the usefulness of this advice is starting to like run thin. So you'll get my take on that. And other ways that they can support us? Other ways you can support us, dear listener, is please, if you have a writer friend, you think this would be really valuable to them, please share this podcast with them. Also, if you go to Apple Podcasts, you can leave us a review and those go a very, very long way. Um, I also want to thank all of the people who have reviewed us so far. We very, very much appreciate it. And if you want to make comments about this particular episode, we will have a link in the show notes to go to our Patreon site for an open post that announces the episode and you can write comments down there. We'd love to have your feedback for how you're liking it what we're doing and how you're liking the various episodes. Yeah, that would be really great. Some feedback would be, it would be stellar. It would be great. We would really appreciate that. Because we can't trust our husband's opinions. No, no, we cannot. <laughs> they have to be nice. They're contractually obligated. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much for listening and we will see you in two weeks. And then we will be finishing this book with the final chapter, the actual Zen in the art of writing chapter. All right. See y'all later. Bye-bye. Bye. Words to Write By is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim smith Adam. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. It's like suddenly my brain starts running really fast. I'm like, what do I got to say? Shit.